Howdy, folks. Welcome to CS128 Honors. Today is another lecture. And for today's topic, we will do a review on genetics and we will introduce you to the concept of kids. First, what is genetics? So genetics are basically abstract statements for concrete types or other properties. So genetics can be used in the definition of structs, such as uh, for the type stored by a vector or enums, for the type returned by inside option or result, or in methods, or in functions. So in the genetic lecture, we looked at, uh, an, at an example of using genetics in functions to remove boilerplate. So here we have two functions, largest i32 and largest char. They both take slices and return the largest value from the slices. So as you can see that the Two functions have basically the same function signature, have the same function body, just with different function signatures. So instead of writing two separate functions, we can combine them into a single function that takes an a generic argument, the function largest, with the argument t, and then we just iterate through the slice and return the largest element. But as we also saw in the last in the generic lecture. So it looks like Rust is unhappy with our code. Specifically, we have an error with our comparison operator here. Why is that? Well, here we are assuming that our generic type T is comparable. So maybe it's some of type R32 or type char as, a, as in the case of the two functions we looked at. But what if T is something like a hash map, then T would be comparable. So that would be an error. So here the error is basically that the concrete type the user input into the function might not be comparable. And so this operator will not be valid. So our problem here is that we basically need to specify that our genetic type must have a comparison behavior. So that means, well, that means that we need to be able to define some abstract actions. In this case, a comparison action in addition to our abstract types that are the genetics. And a potential solution we can look at are interfaces from object-oriented languages, such as C++ or Java. So interfaces, they specify shared action that classes can define some concrete behaviors for, and they do not store data. Here is a diagram illustrating this example. We have an action, make noise, and we have two classes, class dog and class task. The class dog can choose to define make noise as barking, whereas the class cat may define it as mewing. So how do we achieve such a thing in Rust? Well, that's why we have traits. So traits, much like interfaces, they define shared functionality that types can have. Types, they have this shared functionality when they implement the trait. And here is an example of a trait the trace definition, you see the web that have to declare the name of the trait and then the set of functions that type into interwent. Here we have the function summarize that type can define concrete behavior for. Do note that this function don't have a function body. That's because the trait doesn't need to define it. The type that implements the trait will need to define it though. So how do types implement this? Well, here, here's an example. We have the trait summary from earlier. And we also have the struct news article and struct tweet. And here we implement news article for both these structs. For news article, we implement it by basically returning say, uh, the headline with the author and the location. And for a tweet, we return the username and its content. So how the way we implement a trait is to just use the implement block, except uh, we use implement trait name for struct name or type name, and then inside we define the function. This, this must have the same function signature as the as a function in the traits uh in trait definition, but you need to have a actual function, an actual function body for it. In which in this case a we have a format macro. And now 
We know how to implement it. We can summarize news articles and tweets more conveniently. Here you see that we can use we can call the method summarize on both the on both a tweet and a news article. That's because we implemented summarize the text summary on both those structs, which give us this method. And let's look at a concrete example. Here's an example from the slide. We have a an instance of the struct tweet and an instance of the struct news article, and we input and we call the summarize method on them. And let's see what happens when we try to run it. And here, as you can see, the summary to the tweet is printed out, and the summary to the news article is also printed out. So our case works. And how do actually, how do trace interact with genetics? Well, for genetics, we can specify trade bounds on genetic types. A trade bound basically means that the genetic, the genetic type must implement a particular trait meaning it has a meaning the tie has a particular behavior here uh, in the example we have a function notify that takes in an item of some generic type t and then we specify that type t must implement summary in the trace bar here we basically do t colon and the trade name so in the example here we specify that the type of the input to the function must implement the trace summary. And the behavior, what the behavior here is that the item here can be summarized. That means we can call the method summarize on it to get some summary of the item. We can also specify multiple trade bounds using the plus syntax. So here we have the function clone notify. Again, it takes an item. Except this time we want to clone the item before summarizing it. So clone is also an abstract behavior and we also have a trait for that. This is a trait clone. And here to be able to clone T, we must specify clone in the trait bound. And here we use a plus syntax between the two trait bounds to mean that we uh, that the generic must have these two traits. And we can also define trait bounds using the where clause. So here we have a function notify with broadcaster that takes in an item and a broadcaster with, with different, maybe different generic types. And this function return a string. So here uh, in this function, we have a format macro that takes an item, a summary of the item, which is a string as we know, and also, the, and also the broadcaster. So we know that broadcasters must be able to be formatted as a string and just as a trait for that, that is called the trait display, which allows the type to be uh, converted, to, converted to string. And so here we want to specify that u implement display in addition to t implement summary. And so we, instead of this, um, putting them in the function uh, signature, mm -hmm. putting the trait bounds in the function signature and just uh, make the function looks more complicated, we can do a where clause and then just put the trait bounds here. Now, trait bounds can be specified for genetic, for genetic types anywhere they appear. So it can be, it can, it can apply, appear in struct signature, in enum signature, and in implementation blocks. So on the left, you have an example of a trait bound in, an, in the enum signature. You have an enum cases with two cases, first case and second case. And the first case contains a some generic type T. Now we want the type T to be clonable for some reason. So we all we do need to do is just um put clone in the trait bar for T. And then we have an implementation block for cases here. Again, we can also use trait bars. This time T we have the trait bar clone and the trait bar display. Suppose we want to print T for some reason. And on the right, in the example on the right, we have the struct container with uh, the member data 
of some type T, uh, and suppose we want T, we want a, we want to be able to summarize T, so we just put summary in the T bar, and then in the in the implementation block, we can also put it bars. So we want to suppose we want to be able to clone that clone the data to and also print the data. So we can just do clone plus display plus summary. Something to note is that if a genetic type has a test bar in the struct or enum definition, the implementation block must specify the same test bar for just for that genetic type. So here in the enum signature, we have we specify the clone table for T. And so in the implementation block, this clone table must always be put there. So you cannot. Uh, so you must always specify in the importation block the T implements clone. The same thing for the example on the right. Since in the struct definition, we have T implements summary, in the implement block, we must always have the same thing. And let's look at a concrete example. And here, here's an example where uh, we have the function notify and the function notify with broadcaster, broadcaster from earlier. And in the main function, we have a an instance of tweet and a broadcaster, and then I broadcast, that is a string. First, we call the function notify and pass in tweet. And then we, or next, we print out the return value or the function notify with broadcaster. So let's see what happens here. And we see that first the notify function prints out. We are making use and then the summary of the tweet. And also next we have the, we also print out the written value from broadcaster. So we have breaking news delivered by broadcaster and the summary of the tweet. Now, suppose that broadcaster, broadcaster does not implement display. So suppose it is a, yeah. And then we try. So we know that React does not implement the display because there a has a lot of way we can print a React, and that doesn't de provide a default way for that. So React doesn't de uh, implement this state. Now let's try running that again, and see what happens. Well, since the our broadcaster this time doesn't implement display. Um, our code won't compile because we specify in the in this function in the function that the trade bar for you must contain display. You must implement display, and that doesn't. So our code won't compile, and you need to fix it to some displayable type to be able to uh, compile and run it. Now, sometimes types don't actually have to define every method in a date. These non-required methods are called provided methods. They are always implemented in the date definition and the types that implement the date may or may not re-implement them. So here we have the same date summary and we add in another method called self-notify. And this time the method actually has a body. So it's actually implemented. And it all does is that it prints breaking news and then the summary of the of self. We know that self has summarized because it should have input to summarize. Now in the implement block for tweet, we don't we still don't don't actually need to re-implement self notify because it is already provided for us. So we can use this definition if we want. And in the main function, even though we didn't re-implement somewhere self-notify in the implementation block for tweet, we can still call the method on tweet because we have a, an existing definition for that function. Now let's go back to the motivating example. 
the problem we talk about is that we needed to specify that t, the type t in the largest function here, has a comparison behavior. So we trace we have a tool for this. Now we need a trait that is able to define a comparison behavior. Is there such a trait in Rust? And the answer is yes. First, we have the partial equal trait. This trait defines the equal and not equal operators. Here you can see the definition for the trait. We have the trait partial equal. And then we have two methods, a requires method equal, and then a provided method that is not equal, any for not equal. And any type implementing this trait only needs to implement equal. The not equal method simply returns the negation of equal. So you need to implement to define equal, and then you can have the equal and not equal operators on the type. Next, we also have the partial order trait, which defines the strong operators equal, smaller, small, smaller or equal, and greater or greater or equal. So we have five methods, a required method that has must implement named partial underscore comp that returns an ordering, which basically means that, uh, which basically it means that whether you have a smaller, equal, or greater value, and some provided methods for the rest of the operators defined by partial order. Now, our type only needs to implement partial comp because it is required. And this function will define smaller, the smaller, the greater, and then the equal operators. And then the smaller or equal and then greater or equal will simply be inferred from that. Do note that we have an interface like syntax here, where we have partial order colon, partial equal. What this means is that types that implement partial order must also implement partial equal. Here the use is partial equals is just to ensure the correctness of partial com. So you it is there to make sure that partial com returns an equal when it makes sense. Now the summary is that types implementing partial order are comparable. And so this trait is the solution to our problem. And what is the solution? We simply specify the partial order trait in the function definition. So we specify that t has a trait power that is the at least partial order. Now let's look at that example in code. And here is an example. We have the function like this. This time we actually put the partial order trait bar on t. So we can use the greater operator now. And in the main function, we have a vector of integers one to five. And we let result be the result of the largest function call. And then we print it out. So Let's try running it and see what happens. And it brings out the largest number is five, which is what we expect. Now, right, let's go back to slides. So there is a couple of common traits in the standard library that you will want to know about. First, we have the display trait that we already introduced. This trait allows formatting a value as a string. So this trait actually implicitly implements a two string trait, which defines the two underscore string method that you may be familiar with to convert values into string. And third, when you want to convert a value of a struct or an enum into string, prefer implementing display. We also have the from string method, from string trait, this is a counterpart to two string. It allows us to convert string to our type of value. We also have the clone trait that allows cloning a value. This trait defines a clone method. So if you want to clone some generic value of some value of a generic type, you need to be to specify the clone trait bound. We also have the default trait 
that defines a default value for a type. So if a type implements this state, you can create a default value using the syntax type name, colon, colon, default. So which basically calls a default function. We also have the model state. So what this state means is that if the type U implements model with some type T, it means that U can be borrowed as T. Does this sound familiar? Well, we have an example that you are familiar with. The other string type in Rust actually implements borrow on str. That's why we can borrow from a string using the percent str type. So you can borrow an str, you can borrow a string by borrowing an str. And we lastly, we have the hash state, which allows hashing a value. Types must have this state to be able to, able for you to, to, able to be used with the hash map and hash set data structures because obviously these data structures require your value to be hashed. And we also have the into iterator trait. This allows converting a value into an iterator. And this state defines the into underscore iter, the iter and the iter underscore mute methods that you may be familiar with. And it, and it also allows the syntax for item in collection. So you have a vector, you can do item in vector using, because the vector implements this state. And so the vector can be converted into an iterator. In fact, the for loop in Rust is always tied to the into iterator trait. So suppose you have something like for i in zero to vec dot len. What this really means is that we have it's the same thing as this loop for i in the array containing values zero to vec len minus one. And obviously, this is an an instance of the for i for i type in collection loop syntax. And so it uses the iterator iterator trait. Lastly, some traits in the standard in the standard library can be derived, meaning that every members of a struct implemented trait, we can use a derived macro to automatically implement set traits on the struct. So on the left here, we have a struct point when we have the members x y x and y of type i thirty two. So since the type i thirty two implements partial equal and partial or partial order meaning we can, we can compare them, we can actually derive those traits on this struct. And the same thing for the struct, the struct student here, it has a member name of type string. Since string actually implements default, meaning, meaning the string has a default value, we can also derive defaults on the struct student. And on the right, we can see how our example actually is using those derived traits. So, we have two points here, points one and point two. Points one has value, has a members of value three and four, and point two, four and three. And here, the way the partial equal and partial order traits are derived is they use lexical graphical comparison, meaning that members are compared from top to bottom. And the first differing differing member is used for comparison. And so the when they compare the two points, the first member x is compared, and since x of points one is smaller than x then x of point two, points one is smaller than point two, even though the y points one is smaller, is greater than y of point two. Suppose though points one is actually four four instead of three four, then points one could be greater than point two because x are uh, the axes are equal, but the y of point one is greater than the y of point two. And here we have a variable student. That is uh, where we just take the default value for a student by calling student column column default. And since the default string is the empty string, we, uh, if we call the name, the name member of the variable student, we will also be the empty string because, uh, the, because of this property. And some other derivable traits in the set of library are clone, copy, and hash. Now let's look at that example in code. 
Here you see the example from the lecture slide. And then here we are asserting that power, power one is smaller than power two, which we know should be true. And then we are also asserting that the uh, name member of students should be the empty string because the student, because uh, we create, we got the default value of student, which, which should also be true. And let's try running it to see if the asserts actually pass. And they pass, meaning that our assumptions are correct. And that's basically everything about it.